Welcome to Inside the Firm, a podcast dedicated to small business owners and hosted by entrepreneurs, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Each week, they take you on their journey of how to start, run, and grow a business by bringing you inside their architecture and real estate development firm. Get a behind the scene tour of how these business leaders manage their clients and foster company culture while creating new and innovative projects. And now your host, Alex Gore and Lance Psycho. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Firm. I'm here with a special guest. And just because you're on every time doesn't mean you're not special. Thank you. It's Lance. It's now spring, so I'm fishing more. Psycho. Oh, it's so good. Round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I know you were really worried about me. Yes. No longer need to worry. I am your other host, Alex Gitter Dun Gore. Good. And we're here to uh, get her done. And what we're going to talk about today is your firm risk in 2023. Uh, make up your own mind. Think about the data that we're giving you. But our ad read today links up with that, which is our uh, course, architectsguide2.com, which teaches you how to transition or at least expand your base and go from architect to uh, builder. And it's mainly focused on residential building uh, principles and thoughts and stuff like that. I do know some firms that went to uh, commercial space, basically making uh, spaces that they can rent out essentially white boxes that you can put anything in there, a bed store, uh, a lawyer's office, whatever. Um, Go check out architectsguide2.com. Think about if it's something that can expand your base because if a project is nearing or is going to get funded or the people have cash, It is a good foundation to stand on through this possible recession. Possible meltdown. Yep. We'll see. Yeah. The other thing you should check out is Arcat. If you can't find the product data you're looking for, you might be using the wrong search engine. Broad search results result in consumer products, out of date information, and websites that hide or don't have the information you're looking for. If you need specifications, CAD, or or BIM, RCAT.com is your search engine. Find and download the up-to-date data you need fast. RCAT.com is free and requires no registration. So try A-R-C-A-T. Uh, sorry. So, so try RCAT.com. That's A-R-C-A-T.com. A-R-C-A-T.com. Check those guys out. The other thing I need you to check out is Pelloluxury.com forward slash the firm. Why? Because you'll experience a cl- collection of brands that brings your creative vision to life, the luxury division of Pella is a world-class collection of brands, including Duratherm, Riley, and Benelli, all pioneers of industry who provide window and door solutions to discerning architects, the building industry, and beyond. During this new year, we know how important it is to step back and spend time in gratitude. We appreciate all our clients trusting us with their projects in a record-breaking year. We are excited and ready to take on the new year in 2023. The luxury division of Pella doesn't push beyond the limits. They set them. Explore PellaLuxury.com forward slash the firm today check them out all right we finished seven habits of highly effective people did you have any final thoughts i kind of gave mine during the meeting any final takeaways that you had from it it was good reinforcement for and it helped define the habits i was already doing um which were reflected in the book so i think if you even if you are a very highly effective person just having the definitions there and then getting them in your your vocabulary i found myself in several meetings, and a matter of fact, one yesterday with uh, Roxanne, an uh, interior designer we're working with, uh, Gresh, um, two phrases that I that I said during the meeting. I'm like, yeah, begin begin with your end goal in mind. Uh, seek to understand. Critical stuff. Be proactive. Yep. Like, yep. and then everyone on your team knows exactly what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. So you're all on the same page with that, and uh, it's a good base point to start from. So everybody should read that book. I think if you're listening to this show, you're hurting yourself if you're not. Um, if you if you're on Audible, did you know there's a supplemental PDF that kind of uh, gives you all the cliff notes? I just realized that today. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. I, I think you still need to listen to the whole thing. If yeah. you've read it before, and if it was over ten years ago, or if you had any sort of major life event like children's or marriage, just reread it. I read I read it. I don't. Even, I want to say in high school. So that's over like fifteen or sixteen years ago, mm-hmm. and and it was totally worth the reread. Yeah. Uh. So yeah. So uh. I don't know what next book we'll read. Maybe. Something later on that we think about, but so far that's that's kind of how we're starting off the year. And and we will while Lance is pulling up the next topic, we'll probably read another one the beginning of next year. So any suggestions, shoot our way. Um, it has to be firm wide benefit for us to to consider it. But that's what we're thinking. 
Yeah. So, uh, all right. Uh, here's what I've got. Monograph, our good friends over at Monograph, um, put together this amazing 32-page uh, PDF document. It's titled Strategic Risk Report in 2023. And there's some graphs I want to go over with everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, we're not going to read it line by line here, but I think there's some, there's some interesting graphs. So I'm on page four now. And if you're on YouTube, you're, you're watching it, and you can see what we're talking about. Uh, if you're listening to Ashley, I'll just try to explain it. So on page four here, they talk about economic instability impacts clients and project pipeline. Following a growth cycle fueled by low interest rates, clients are now facing uncertain financials as more projects get delayed or canceled. As a result, firm leaders are preparing for new business development demands to compete for clients and replace lost projects. So the, the graph that they show is really interesting here. Um, basically, it's a timeline showing the the 2008 recession, and they showed the expanse of the gr of the recession. It lasted for about a year, is what they say. Um, even though you can see the growth was like pretty pretty crappy, and then it moves forward to the 2020 recession, uh, which is very short because it was a sort of this uh, manufactured recession, right, with the shutdowns and all that stuff. And then they printed all the money. We've talked about it a million times. And then all of a sudden, the inflation went through the roofs because people were home and with a bunch of money, and then they wanted to remodel, and then they pushed. And then and then on top of that, factory shut down and all of a sudden. So it just kind of this crazy, per like, perfect storm for inflation to see, like, the highest I've ever seen in my lifetime uh, that I can remember. And then at the end of the graph, then the Fed tried to then beat down the, int uh, the inflation and increase interest rates. And so what that led to is... What's so great about that graph is you can see the 2020 recession. They printed all the money, and general inflation just, just goes up like it's literally uh, one cause to one. and effect. One to one. One to one. Don't, uh, yeah, don't tell me the correlation isn't there. It's 100% there. That, that's the, defi the definition of inflation is you're, pr you're printing money, and then the goods cost more because there's more money demanding those only <laughs> set amount of goods. Uh so they go on to elaborate here, and I thought this was probably the best takedown, or not takedown, but elaboration of it from uh, one of the principals over at Olson Kundig. Firms prepare for a pause and rush project cycle. Hermansu Perwani, HP principal, owner, CEO of Olson Kundig, warns that many firms are coming off a very busy period with a huge wave of work and projects that push them to expand their workforce. That is wave could crest capital uncertainty causes a cr creates a pause and rush cycle for clients where projects go dormant then suddenly resume which destabilizes billing and resourcing but not all projects will resume robert yen ceo of monograph highlights the importance of getting a clear picture of the health of your current and future project pipeline with a strong network to bring in new work ask yourself he says quote how many projects are going to last the next 12 months, end quote. By engaging clients proactively, firms can anticipate timeline disruptions and build on their client work sh relationships. Al, what do you think about uh, that statement he made? How many projects are going to last you the next 12 months and how, how it's applied to us? I know you just had a conversation with a developer with the asking them, like, how are they feeling about all this? What's crazy is that, like, it, it completely... It completely rests on what the the Fed's gonna do. If they keep raising, are they gonna raise rates next week? John Kyle says no. I, I John Kyle no. says yes, and, 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 and I say no. We're gonna go into it because I want to talk about after this the construction leg effect, which is huge, and then recap the current banking crisis, and and that will explain why I think no and why they cannot do it whatsoever. Yeah. Good. Okay. We'll we'll pause that thought. My just my thoughts are so like back to Robert's point here about how many projects are going to last in the 12 months. If you don't have somewhere worked out like we do, we just put, we do estimates now uh, so then we can project how much billable work we have in the future using QuickBooks, whether you're using FreshBooks or a spreadsheet or whatever. If you aren't doing that and then asking your clients, um, just having a little heart to heart with them, I think you have an excellent excuse right now to say, hey. I'm sure you're well aware now of the issues in bank in the banking sector and in the finance sector that have happened over the last week. Just wondering how you're feeling about everything. Yeah. Um, 
would love to would love to know if you know you're still planning on moving full steam ahead or if you feel like you're maybe are going to pause those those proactive discussions i think need to happen and why it's key is because i've had those discussions with two different people one in northern colorado who thinks hey especially after that meeting things are going to kick back up and things are going to be good again i talked to a client in southern colorado and i i asked like oh are you seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and he said no we're not like (laughs) it's dead yeah dead yeah my wife hasn't. My wife, the realtor, as everybody's heard her multiple times in the show, has not sold a house in four months. So, pretty tricky situation. Uh, okay, on the next page, page five here, we've got another great graph, and the figure is showing uh, total construction spending in the United States, not seasonally adjusted, January two thousand three to December twenty twenty two. A architectural engineering firms have benefited. From over a decade of growth in the construction industry following the 2008 recession. So, you know, what goes up maybe has to go down and all of that. Um, again, it's this linear graph just showing that we've just steadily increased, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down. But the, the overall line is increasing uh, in construction spending. Uh, they go on to say project shortages increase competition for new clients. Competition has intensified as more firms pursue fewer projects to make up for lower forecasted billings. We're seeing a lot more clients approach hiring an architect as a design competition, pitting multiple firms against each other, says uh, Hemanshu Perwani, principal owner of CEO Kosun Kundig. This puts firms who are less invested in their marketing and business development at a disadvantage. Industry uh, advisors to architecture and engineering firms are coaching leaders to start by nurturing existing client relationships in person to help reinforce a positive client experience. So no more, again, push came to shove. Maybe we're moving out of this whole, everybody's on Zoom, we're working from the planet Mars. Uh, You might consider that uh, with with your clients. Let's see here. Uh, There was one that really... Okay. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So now I'm moving on to page nine here. Uh, Again, I'm just going with with sort of looking at these graphs because I think they... These were the, to me, like the cliff note note bullet points that were important to talk about. Just so we see where the state of everything is and like, you know, your strategy maybe throughout this year. So page nine shows another graph and it's got linear again and it's comparing... AE services, so architecture and engineering services, inflation, like uh, what you are charging um, compared to the construction inflation. And there's a huge gap in between because we had uh, all the soaring prices and everything like that. So they say uh, many firms are facing, facing cash flow issues after growing their team to meet an influx of projects. But as rising construction costs burn through client budgets, firms did not adjust their fees to match higher labor costs. Now firms with lower profit margins are looking for ways to manage project disruptions. We are not in this category. We actually staff down. And at the same time, we we increase fees all the way throughout the last year. However, Al, my question to you is, if somebody's listening to this and they did not do what we did, so they increase their staff, and at the same time, they did not increase their fees and now they're in this pinch and now they want to they're looking for ways to manage project disruptions and make themselves more lean like what would you what would you do if you were those people okay you have to know your firm you have to know your backlog how much work you have going out and if that's decreasing and you should maybe notice a trend if the amount of work so that's one point the other point is the amount of work that you're billing, like billable work, is that going up or down? If both of those are going down, and if you have a staff of any, you know, like, I mean, greater than two, you know, three, four, five, six, ten, twenty, thirty, 20, 30, you have to think right now, if, if this continues for a month, another month, three months, you, you might have to lay some people off. You might have to lay some people off and those numbers are going to tell you. And, and here's the thing we've done it before. Um, it's something you have to do. It's something you have to do. Like I, there's no way getting around it. 
Yeah. Like the, I think it, the only your only your only possible pivot point is like it's now the hindsight twenty twenty is like should you have tried to do more with less? Should you have tried to jump on the Revit rocket ship? Should you have tried to develop some Dynamo scripts? Should you have you should you have uh, bought a laser scanner? Should you have been trying to do those sort of things from the get go? And then maybe you're avoiding staffing up. Yeah. So you you know. And and here's the other thing. Like let's say you see those trend lines going down, right? Maybe you have some reserve, and maybe you think like, hey, if those go down, even if they go down for the next three months, I can use my reserve and maybe for five or, or six months, because if things go back, come back to 2020 levels, 2019 levels, I'm going to want those people. Yeah. Now, now, if you went totally overboard and you have too many, like then, then you just know like you have to cut. Like I would think about it this way. Like think about this year is 2019, 2020. Yeah. How much staff did you hire? In 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, 23. Do you need to have some hard conversations? Yeah. Exactly. Don't sell yourself short. Uh, and then the next slide on 16 shows something uh, very telling about that, right? So it's got another linear graph here, and it shows the number of employees in the, in the architecture and engineering industry. It's at a record high since 2003 anyway. And uh, it's just it's just skyrocketed. So after a period of growth, firms that overhired are now trying to manage excess staffing capacity. So if you're in that boat, uh, that's a tough one. But I think you need to uh, sort of be aware of those things and like what the you know where the cookie is sort of crumbling and all of that. Um, last one I want to talk about is so uh, <coughs> it's um, the total compensation and uh, the industry competes for talent slide here on page 23 firm leaders struggled to compete for talent to meet the demands of a growth cycle and in slower cycles with fewer projects they face new challenges with retaining talent and investing in future leadership like al was saying because if you're if you're trying you know i think one of the big goals you should always have is like on these downturns trying to maintain and keep the staff that you've worked so hard on training and getting in your systems because if you can come out intact mostly intact if not all intact with that, you're going to be your prime. Your pump is going to be primed and be ready to take on the world. Mm -hmm. So would love to hear what you have to say, Al, on the uh, on the old YouTube here. And I think we probably need to switch. Yeah, you want to switch, switch the old uh, monitor. OK, I'm going to bring up uh, some views here. And this will probably make sense once you see it in here. So Lance, do you see this? Mm -hmm. It's called the construction leg effect. And what's, what this is doing is it, it's a chart of how many permits there are and then how many units are under construction. And it makes sense that units under construction lag permits because you need a permit before yeah. you can make the construction. Yeah. And this graph is starting from 1985 and it's going to uh, 1988. Yep. So you can see in blue the the construction permits peak at 1,856. This is probably per some mil, you know, like this is just relative. A per capita. Yep. A per capita estimate. And then six months later, units under construction peaked and then it fell. Makes total, total sense. Here's another one. This is in 2006. You probably saw. Yeah. There was a six months lag and then construction fell. And then what happens was the units under construction, that means once that falls, people start losing their jobs yeah. in construction. Mm -hmm. So each of the last one, two, three, four major uh, recessions, when there was a peak, there was a lag, construction units go down, and then uh, people going down. Remember one of the biggest things with the Fed is they kept subtly saying, uh, and they'd use their own words, but essentially... Unemployment isn't going up, isn't going up, which is what they kind of need for prices to go down, even though that's not cool of them to do. Yeah. Do you see this? The latest one in 21, 22 permits have gone down and they went down in last summer. So far, it's been about 10 months, not five months and construction units counts have not gone down. 
his explanation is because there was such a backlog, Mm -hmm. such a backlog. But if you see everything else and if history repeats, you can't it always ha- rhymes at least. But you can't have permits go down and you can't have construction to continue to go up. Like you can't build a building without a permit. It yeah. So I think everyone has been playing catch up and normally that catch up would happen within 6 months. Now it's happening within 10 months to 12 months. But if if permits don't pick back up, which I mean at least I know a lot of people aren't thinking about starting new projects. Yep. Uh, bigger projects until the Fed meeting. And then you know how long it takes to do all the architecture drawings and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He basically says like, there's a huge bubble gap that's going to happen because it takes time. Like these construction projects are going to start to die because they're going to be completed. It's weird seeing this graph and then seeing like, it's not correlated like the other, like all the way back to 1971. There's this direct correlation between the two, which makes sense, right? They're symbiotic, but it will be like, it has to be eventually. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So that's what everyone was saying, what, like, hey, there's a lag effect, the lag effect. So if there's a huge lag effect, here's the only thing that's upsetting for uh, the construction side. It's an, And let's say they change policies immediately. It's not like you can start building the next day. You need those permits. Yeah. You need those permits. So a lot of developers and, and stuff like that, it's actually on on them right now. Like, how big do you want that bubble gap to be? And... Honestly, you could be if you if you started now, you know how long it takes. You could be the only thing up ready to go on the market and conditions could be prime at the end of the year for inflation coming down and all that. Interest rates coming down. Yep. Or you can wait and then be within the 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 herd when everything else comes online. It's hard because like it's hard for them to get money mm-hmm. and all yeah, that. The financing getting getting the financing is difficult. And 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 here is one of the reasons why. I'm yeah. Holy cow, mouse! I know mine. Mine started being weird yep. like that too. So Sorry. <clears throat> we're gonna do extremely quick recap of the current banking crisis. But yeah. if you want to, um, episode one nineteen on All In podcast. Those, really good. Really good. Those guys are Silicon Valley guys, and this was a Silicon Valley start of a problem. And they go in deep, and most people don't know what they're talking about when you hear about this stuff, but they do like, wouldn't you agree? They were really good. Yep. Okay. So here's what's happening and it's happening to, to other banks too behind the scenes. And here's why people think that there is somewhat a contagion and, and, and people are kind of don't know what to do with their money. And and that's why Bitcoin's going up too. They're putting it in there. Okay. So we have always been essentially increasing the supply of money besides right now. Right. So what that means is that a bank gets money and then obviously people have to they have to give out the money back when when people ask for their money back. But normally they get that money. They have to keep some in reserve and then they put others in different areas. And a lot of times it's treasuries. Right. U.S. Treasuries. When the money flow stops, they're not getting an increase, but people still need to take out money Mm -hmm. to pay their bills and stuff like that. So all of a sudden, they're not getting the average increase. So they're not able to just give you money that I'm just putting in because it's not coming in. So now what do they have to do? They have to sell what they invested those money in that they wouldn't normally have to sell, right? So let's say, Lance, <coughs> you are the federal government, right? Hey! Yep. And, and, and I am the bank. Yep. And I say, hey, I'm going to give you $100. Mm-hmm. This is in 2020. Mm-hmm. And then, hey, in 10 years, will you give me 105 back? And you're like, sure. Yep. Let's try it out. Okay. Now it's 2023. We're only three years into the 10 years. I say, I ask you, Lance, uh, hey, I'm going to give you $100. Interest rates are high. Are you giving me $115 in 10 years? Uh, I'll try. <laughs> I'm going to try. Yes. That's happening. <clears throat> Now I need to sell that one from 2020. Oh, the first one where I was going to give you five bucks back. Five bucks. Who's going to buy that? <laughs> because they can just go to the government and get it's the one. junk. Basically, it's a junk bond. It's That's junk. That's the point. Yep. yep. So Peter Schiff has been saying this is a bubble forever. Just saying. Not enough money coming in and then people pulling out at a normal rate or they got a little bit scared and crazy in, in Silicon Valley and then took out even more than, than was probably necessary. 
causes a bank run. And not that everyone, here's the problem is that if another bank just doesn't have a bank run, but isn't getting enough input and has to sell these, and then people get word of it, then that causes a bank run. Yes. And what the Fed did, which I think is not the worst idea, is the Fed said, we're going to open up a window and we're going to say, hey, bank, if you have this problem, we know that you will make money in the future off that 105. Give that to us as collateral. We'll give you that money. And then you can pay off your people rather than trying to sell it at loss at the market. Makes sense. I actually buy it. In the short term, it's not a bad idea. Why? Because it actually is a backstop. But in the long in the long term, unless one fundamental thing ever happens and it'll never happen, government spending gets cut like drastically, like 99%. Then, then in the long term, it could play out. But see, that's never going to happen. We're just continuing the Ponzi scheme and kicking the can down the road, and it is what it is. And here's why. So I actually follow that logic and kind of approve. You'll hear um, another perspective. It's a bailout. They shouldn't get a bailout. And they'll say, some people will say it's causing taxpayers money. Some people it's not. It is through inflation because it's an Thank easier you. way. I was going to freak out if you didn't say that. It's hurting. It's a tax on you indirectly yep. through inflation. Yep. But it's also saving a bunch of just middle class, normal people from not having these bank runs and all these monies and, and then banks collapsing, going to bankruptcy, and then you don't even get your money back. You would because a m- bunch of us don't have over 250. And what the, and what, and but what, if it cascades, they would run out of money. It's not about the consumer having over $250,000. It's about does your company have over $250,000 in their checking account to cover payroll? That's the pro- That's how it actually ends up coming back to the middle class. Yep. Just want to make that clear. And the second reason why it's a bailout, even though I, I kind of agree with one because they are stuck in a corner. A, be- corner, be- in a corner of a corner, as I've been saying for two years. Yep. Um, here, here's why it's also a bailout. Lance, let's say uh, financial hardships happens just on me for some reason. Who knows? Al, okay. Al bought like uh, a, a bunch of an NFT. An NFT. He's yep. like an idiot. Yep. <laughs> and all of a sudden I go, well, you know what? By 2024 or 2026, my current holds of Bitcoin should go up. Sure. But I have to sell mine now at a loss, which I don't. Just FYI. But if I did, oh, why can't I give this to the federal government? They give me the full amount. You know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. it's they're kind of. They're kind of helping out, like they're not learning the hard lesson of ever of ever. Holy cow! Because there's austerity. instruments just hard austerity for a couple of years. Yep. But so to, there's instruments that they could have used mm-hmm. so that they could have hedged what was coming and what they should have known was coming. But the other thing too is, hey, federal government, everyone's been built on this Ponzi scheme of more money comes into the bank to cover it, yep. and you just change that. That's why it also could just be total collapse if they didn't do this because they would have been. It would have been. It would have been. They're not printing more money. Yeah, it would have been. Yeah, it would have been. It would have been. It would have hundred percent have been the. Uh, so it's a weird. You gotta wonder. Uh, what I wonder is like. So if, if everybody, if everybody knows how this works, right? Like, uh, the FDIC, it, it insures your money up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars in in a bank, right? Because they were trying to learn from. They were trying to, so that they, they, since the inception of the Federal Reserve in 1913, that was the idea is that they're going to provide the backstop for bank runs in that situation when it happened, like in the, in the, during the Great Depression and, and the stock market tr- crash in 1929 and all that. I, I wonder if they've always had this in their back pocket where they're like, well, our next big one's going to be, we'll just do it o- over a hundred, we'll do unlimited. At this point, because that's all it is. Now they're saying, like, if you have over two hundred fifty thousand, you we're the backstop for you. I I'm like, how did how did no one see this? I'm kind of I'm kind of feels I kind of feel stupid that I didn't predict that. That like, oh, that's they've always had that in their back pocket. And 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 here's the problem with them, because it seems like an easy solution that they should just do. But right now they are logically taking um, <laughs> their own uh uh. What do you call it? Um, what did what what did everyone buy? Bonds, yeah. government bonds, and like 
okay, you're literally giving government bonds for cash. It, it makes sense. What if banks decide like, oh, we'll just give them like, we have stock in um, shitty company that's going to die. Corporate. Let's say our, our own bank. <laughs> we have we have our own bank stock. We'll give that to them. All of a sudden, it it, it bends. It becomes like, oh no, those aren't those aren't real things that are going to return it's, money. It's just more fake collateral. Fake collateral, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Fake collateral, and, and and that's where it gets it gets tricky. It's that's how it's a Ponzi scheme. You see what I'm saying? Like it's all built on fake. It's all fake from the beginning. And it's and just, it's all tr- it's all trust. Yep. One of the persons made a great point. Like if you want to insure higher than 250, there should be a way to do it. And the way to do it would be like, you can choose to be in that account. They can only invest in, in uh, like real assets, let's say real estate, government bonds and something else that's safe. So you're going to make less money in that the bank is, and you're going to make less interest on that. But now it's guaranteed. It shouldn't just be blanket to everyone. You sh- there literally needs to be trade-offs or else we're going into this fake world of Modern monetary theory where people Hyper. just thought, think like, oh, it's okay. Just just uh, uh, print it, uh, solve it. What does that lead to? Hyperinflation. Like that is the problem. That is literally one of the hugest causes of World War II. Guess where we're at? The brink of World War III. And, <laughs> and, and, and why, this is, why this is tied is because frustration in other areas. I'm frustrated because I bought NFTs. Right, Al's mad. It was a monkey. Yep, it, it was a monkey. I can try to be as, as stoic and and uh, seven habits principles R- reserved. Yep, yep. And maybe I'm good enough to not let that affect the business and my interactions with you. But not everyone is as perfect and as awesome as me. And I beard. might you seen this beard. And chances are I might crack. So what I'm saying is that that goes on systemic levels. You have. Uh, cracks in finances you have cracks in your business you have cracks in 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 russia you're already funding it like for people who don't know i don't know if i said this on uh, live like you should be aware that america's already at war with russia 100 percent. already at war yeah if you are giving and i'm not saying that you even if you want to reduce it to this phrase but but it's the truth because this is like the bottom phrase i'll allow proxy war it's a proxy war Sure. You know, fund, sure. you're funding a proxy sure. war. Sure. Sure. But to to make the analogy extremely straightforward, if I'm mad at Lance and I tell some of the guys to go to his house and light it on fire and I give them all the stuff, I tell them when to do it, where to do it, uh, show them how to do it, train them how to do it, and then it happens and then they get caught. Do you think I'm not going to be sitting in a trial? As it, as what uh, being prosecuted yeah. for doing that? Yes, I literally did everything but light it. it it's 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 <laughs> it's organized crime. Like or- I literally organized the crime yeah, to do it. Yeah, it's mafia, yeah. mafia. Wow, we went off on a tangent. Al went on off on a tangent. Uh, but don't worry. <laughs> oh, great! The Thank most you. successful <laughs> businessman in the world is here to read for us today. I just can't believe he's going to grace us again with him on the show. I just love this guy so much, Elon Musk. Wow. Is on the on the show on uh, the brink of basically in the past week. I don't know if you know this. We're recording this on March third, seventeenth, twenty twenty three. Chat GPT four was released, and now it can input audio. It can input images, and the we we are so rapidly advancing with this. I just you really need to look into it. Uh, I think just to be aware of what's going on because I think the center once once the singularity happens. I, I don't, I, it's going to, that'll be part of the fourth turning. Like it has to be. I mean, it's just like, we are so on the brink of this. It's it, every week me and Al are just freaking out. Like, do you see what it can do now? Yeah. So uh, here's Elon, his take on it. I never in my life, and especially last two years when people talk about an AI, say a uh, human, human being will be controlled by machines. I never think about that. I think it's, 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 it's impossible, right? It's impossible because human beings, they are different. Machines are invented by human beings. And according to the science, right, humans can never create another animal that is smarter than humans. Especially when you have so many smart people, it's impossible to make another smart people. I, I very much disagree with that. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Um, 
No, okay. No. Yeah, my view is that um, computer may be clever, but human being are much smarter. Yeah, definitely not. Clever is very academic. So I told <coughs> those guys, they are very sad. So, ah. Uh, Computer will be smarter than human beings because computer can play chess better. Ah, I think you are stupid to compete with that. Don't do that. So this is, well, this is we well, always do things we are good at. Sure, okay, well, what would be an example of something that humans are better than a computer at? And, and then let's see if that happens. Well, humans, computer is only one of the clever tools that human created. And hu computers are, are clever, but there will be more tools that human beings will create, much cleverer than computers. That's my view. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so that really wasn't Elon Musk, uh -huh. that was it. Yeah. Well, okay. Why did you have to show that? Because because Elon. Okay, so Elon. If everybody doesn't know, he's an investor, and one of the early, in in the AI in Chat GPT and AI and, and all of that and, and getting that going and everything. So I, I like if there's anybody who is a who should be, um, who who should who you could look to as a source of I don't know maybe their opinion holds more weight than that other guy who started talking. It's probably Elon, and he's interested in it but at the same time very scared about it if it ever ends up going awry in that sort of way which in his world then that's that's the whole idea with with um doing the neuron stuff what i can't remember neural link neural link is because he's like look the singularity is going to happen and there's two for forms of the singularity just in case everybody doesn't know my wife didn't know this i showed her last night there's a clip on Joe Rogan actually from this guy from San Diego. You probably watched the episode out where he talks about the singularity in like <clears throat> the elaborate way. And then there's sort of the unelaborate way that Elon's talking about where it's like, we're going to merge with machines. Like why, why you're going to get to that point where you're going to be able to then have this neural, neural link. You're going to be able to talk to chat GPT. It's going to learn from you. You're going to learn from it. And you're going to hopefully control it. That's his method of trying to control the demon that is AI as, as it's, as it's coming out and everything. So that it doesn't just completely overwhelm us and, and completely take over us. Like we need to stay in control of this thing and check it, basically. Yep. And then the other version of the singularity is like this guy explained it perfectly on, on Joe's show. And it was, <clears throat> look, you're going to with the rise of AI, AI is going to figure out um, it's going to help you compute even faster and figure out like Elon's idea of creating all of these energy banks all around the world and accelerating like fusion in energy creation and accelerating adoption of uh, you know electric cars or stuff like that the 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 rapid pace of all of it because if you look at like the the charts on if you've seen them if you just look up a uh, chat gp chat gpt1 versus chat gpt4 the amount of data that it can do and the amount of computations like it's 500 times more powerful than the previous version so I generally think that technology advances are overpromised and that, and that there's ceiling. Al tech expert, expert Gore, but to get on your side and Elon's side, normally it takes a long, long time to solve one problem. And then, then after it solves that problem, the next problems fall faster. For example, it took computers, 40 years to be better at chess than anyone else. And now like it took 10 years or 20 years to be better at any game that you program it and it'll be better th than you. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So imagine a scenario like this. Take, take a, a car. Elon's cars can't drive themselves fully yet. It's taken over 10 years of promises, mm -hmm. but I, I can't imagine within the next five years that a car won't be able to drive itself. Okay. What that means is visual awareness, visual decision making, and a whole bunch of stuff right there. Then take chat GBD. It can already write better than every high schooler. It can already uh, program better than every high schooler. It can already make art better than every high schooler. It can already make uh, movie clips better than every art person. It can already probably have a conversation better than most high schoolers. Like, are you agreeing with all this? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now take a third thing. Uh, Construction robots, right? 
They don't get tired. Manufacturing robots, right? They can do a task, stuff like that. I'm not saying that that's that smart now. Yeah. All of a sudden can c- combine the visual awareness and understanding a perception of a, a driver uh, list vehicle with all the language and creative ability of chat GDPT in a humanoid robot that you can program to do, you know, physical stuff too. And once all three of those merges, like you might be walking and talking with a robot in 10 years and saying, Hey, can you please do X, Y, Z tasks? It can communicate. It can see, it can be like, that's, that's crazy. Like, can you, do you get the, the picture yeah. of a, so You're just that, that, that person, let's just say on a job site, I'm just making, it could be, it could go in a total different, rec, different direction. Oh, you're better than every construction worker ever? Because it has accumulative knowledge. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So that's what you just described is that you described it in a different way, but it's, it's still it's still the same thing in one of the versions of the singularity. Yep. Yeah. 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 And it's going to happen. So <laughs> even though you're, it sounds like you're kind of agreeing that like. No, I was. I just, I had to state my yeah. preamble first. Sure. Cool. Well, until uh, we, until then, I think we uh, we should probably get into some ARE Jeopardy, y'all. All right, let's do it. All right. These questions, again, are from our friend. And what is the book? ARE 5.0. Yep, ARE 5.0. You got it. Yep. yep. Question number one. Which of the following would not typically be suggested as a natural cooling <coughs> strategy? Okay. Is it A, stack ventilation, B, evaporative cooling, C, trom wall, or D, shade tree? Lance, I think this one's wrong. Which of the following typically would not be suggest not be suggested? No, no, this is right. This okay, is right. let's see. Yep. Okay, we got B. This is right. C. C. Okay. The answer is C. Why C instead of B? So C is trom wall. B is evaporative cooling. Because it's the word typically. You're not typically going to suggest trom if out of all of those three. Yeah, oh. this is easy. Yeah. You guys are blowing. Wow, pay oh, attention. I don't know. Back oh. to school. Everybody back to school. No, just me and Jason are going back to school. Apparently, wasn't Ross confused? Okay. All right. <laughs> Question two: Which construction type would be typically associated with light frame wood construction? A, type two. B, type three. C, type four. D type five. Yeah. Good question, Mark. Which light wood frame construction? Which construction? Type which construction type would be? Would be a yep. Yeah. No kidding. D All right. D D. All right. All right. Number three. Which form of dis- dispute resolution would be considered the least costly? Is it typically the first step in attempting a resolution? Is it A litigation, B medita- mediation, C arbitration, D subpoena? Correct answer is B, mediation. You do not go straight to litigation. That'd be terrible. Number four, during construction and a typical design build, sorry, during construction and a typical design bid build project, which entity should not be stopping work on the project site? Is it A, the architect, B, the owner, C, the contractor, or D, the building inspector? And the correct answer is A, the architect. Okay. Is, did we? Per, everybody's got four for four? Wow. Three? Yeah. Okay. Tiebreaker, uh, Gresham Ross. Whoever says it the fastest, okay? Uh, I'm going to not even read them all. I'm just going to, you guys, yeah. yep. You have to say. You just got to say it. Which roof covering classification would be considered the most effective okay. in with... Whoa. Okay. All right. <laughs> Where are we going to eat? <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Which one? Urban Field Pizza, the one on South South oh, yeah, Station. Oh, that's good. It's good. I, 
abide by that. All right, Lance. We are not doing that. Yeah. Take a- uh, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you leave like, subscribe, leave us a positive comment. If you're listening on iTunes, five-star reviews, and send that fan mail in. We'll see you next week. Thank you.